Welcome. My name is David Lamb and I'm with the Soil Health Institute. And I want to welcome you to today's Healthy Soil Farmer Showcase. Today we're going to be focusing on soil health activities in the great state of Georgia. Soil health in the cotton and peanut rotation. The Soil Health uh, Healthy Soil for Sustainable Cotton project is, is a joint partnership between the Soil Health Institute and partners from Wrangler Jeans and the Walmart Foundation providing the fund this, funding for this project of which this webinar series on showcasing various uh, uh, soil health activities in the six states that we're working, uh, that we're doing here. Um, a lot of you probably never heard of the Soil Health Institute. We're a relatively new not-for-profit group started about five or six years ago uh, with the idea or mission to safeguard and enhance the vitality and productivity of soil through scientific research and advancement. And what we're trying to do is support and, and bring out the science behind soil health. And many people say there's not a lot of science. Well, that's not correct. Uh, and there is a lot of science behind that. And you're gonna hear some of this through some of our producers we're talking to, uh, who'll be talking about here in a little bit. And again, these types of things don't happen by, uh, by accident. They provide require funding. And we appreciate the generous donation of both Wrangler Jeans and the Walmart Foundation to support this project and make these types of activities like we're having today possible. Uh, the project started three years ago, or two years ago, excuse me, with two, two key objectives. One was just simply to increase the adoption of soil health management systems by cotton producers and, and across the cotton uh, belt states. And then the other part, uh, objective was to quantify uh, the production and environmental benefits that these systems are providing, not only to the producers themselves, but to society uh, as a whole. We've, this is our fifth webinar in the series. Uh, if you want to watch the previous four, uh, you can go to uh, Soil Health Institute's uh, YouTube page and there are replays are available, uh, usually about the week after the event has taken place. But I also want to point out that besides today, we have three more before this series will be ending. Uh, we'll be talking about some what to produce from North Carolina next week, uh, followed by some producers in South Carolina, and then with a group of uh, kind of agricultural leaders, uh, the final webinar series. But I always like to start these, you know, set the stage, because what we're trying to do is get producers to look at soil health in a new way, you know, or to look at soil in a new way, looking at it more as a healthy system. You know, the definition we use is the idea of soil having a continued capacity of the soil of function as a vital living ecosystem that sustains plants, animals, and humans. We look at the long term, we're looking at something that's alive, but we're trying to get farmers to focus on those functions that they need to produce or, or for, to raise food and fiber. What are those functions? You gotta cycle nutrients, you gotta let water soak into the ground, and you gotta give it back up when the plant needs it. We expect our soils to be able to filter and buffer out some type of pollutant, help break those down those products that we may apply. Big one here is we expect our soils to support our agricultural activities. It doesn't do us much good to plant a crop if you can't harvest it and run up your field. And one thing we overlook is we expect our soil to be a habitat for a diversity of soil microbes, so soil organisms. And, and as you can see in the picture, you see a couple of nice earthworms sitting in there. And what we need to realize is that 90% of these activities is mediated by those soil organisms where you're creating that habitat for them to thrive. How do we do that? And the key is you hear these four producers talk today, listen to this, where they fit into these soil health principles. The idea of minimizing disturbance, maximizing residue cover, that provides, that protects the habitat, provides organic matter and, and so forth. And the other two feed the system. You need to keep take advantage of living roots that grow 24 hours, 24 seven, all year round in many parts of the cotton belt and increase uh, diversity in the system through crop production and maybe even throw a few cows in there once in a while. That helps feed and drive, the, drive that, that habitat, provides a good food source for those organisms that like to live there. One quick thing, and then I'll turn it over to our day, today's moderator is if you wanna ask a question, there's a Q&A box at the bottom. All you have to do is click on that, and type in an answer or your question. We'll be asking them as we go along and, uh, and hopefully we'll be able to get your answer uh, that you're looking for and, uh, as we go along. Now with that, I'm gonna stop sharing and I'm gonna introduce uh, Peyton Sapp, who Peyton 
is uh, today's moderator, and he is the uh, Burke County Extension Coordinator, and he's responsible for all the ag extension activities that take place uh, there in Burke County and, and, and even some of the other uh, counties he provides some assistance to. So Burton or Peyton, I'm going to let you introduce your producers and just take, take it away. Uh, thank you, David. Um, thank you said that you would help me monitor the chat. Uh, so if there is a specific question, I think myself and the farmers we have on would probably do much better just answering them as they come, you know. Uh, I, I, I'll make this point later, but I think this, this group uh, thrives off of sharing together and, and that's one thing we're missing in the face-to-face -face opportunity. So anyway, I'll make it more real if the questions come up as they come along. Uh, I, I just I wanted to introduce myself in, in addition to what David said. I've been in extension as a county agent for 27 years and uh, since in Burke County since 2008. And uh, uh, I would say that Burke County is extremely diverse as far as its ag production systems. Um, and I would say we're much like, even though we're over on the east side of the state, um, when you think of our ag production systems, think of Southwest Georgia and, and uh, we're, we're identical to what goes on down in that area. Uh, so uh, anyway, just, just wanted to do that in the way of introducing myself. Uh, also, and one more thing, I, I saw that uh, Jacob Sandiford was our fifth uh, grower that was going to participate, and I'm hoping that Jacob will also um, uh, make some comments as we go through today. So uh, anyway, it, it, he may or may not, but since it's not planned. Uh, I, let's just start off and we'll, I'll, I'll say the names of the growers we have, and we'll let them kind of do their thing uh, as we move forward. We. Uh, Rocky Yelton, uh, Gain Story, uh, Burton Heatwall, and then also today with us is uh, the superintendent of our uh, Southeast Research and Education Center, Anthony Black. So let's, uh, we'll just move straight in and, and, and let Rocky, maybe we can pull up his slides and let him uh, talk for this. Okay, um, as Peyton was talking about, this was my corn planting uh, last year of 2020. Um, we started off, didn't know what we were going to plant, and got a little late in the game, and I hadn't burned down yet, and I had um, some of it weaker, some of it stronger, but most of it was you know, knee high or better uh, crimps and clover, and I, in the past, have had a lot of trouble with something being dead seven, ten days or so, and clover really getting chewy and trying to wrap up in my row cleaners and thing else, so we just decided I was going to try it in the green. Um, we pulled in there and started, and it was very easy. The planter went right through it, left a perfect little gap there. Um, we didn't spray herbicide until seven days after planting. I wouldn't have sprayed it then, but my clover was trying to stand back up, and I was scared it was going to shade out my little corn plants when they were cracking. I was trying to, you know, maximize nitrogen fixation as long as I possibly could. Um, <clears throat> turned out, I mean, it was a very successful test. I think uh, we got it adjusted at like 252 bushels to the acre was over with reduced uh, reduced fertility and reduced irrigation. I think I sent that to you the other day, Peyton. I think I was like right at 10 inches of irrigation total for the year in the cover. Um, well, we had some good rain, so, but to me, that's, that's pretty uh, consistent water savings compared to normal. Um, so that's what these slides were. Uh, I would encourage somebody to try that plant in the green. I don't know how, you know, I don't know how well that will work for us in cotton, um, but it, it worked extremely well in corn and it will not be the last time I do it. Uh, Rocky, you, you mentioned uh, what you just said there about uh, reducing your inputs um, would you just tell them I mean you consult for people you you see a lot of acres out here what what would be a typical nitrogen uh, for, you know the season rate for 250 bushel corn for us um, most they say I, I scout 
you know, 10, 15,000 acres a year and do soil fertility on anywhere from 30 to 35,000 acres with soil sampling and fertility recommendations. Um, nitrogen on corn for somebody in the 245, 250 bushel yield goal, I would say an average around here would be putting out 300 units um, split multiple time. With this clover, I think I was like at 240, and I, I think I got a little bit scared at the end. Um, I had a little bit of uh, firing up on the bottom of my plants, so I went ahead and put another 20 or 30 units at the end and got up. Um, probably didn't have to, but uh, I just wanted to make sure that I maximized yield. But I see I got a, a considerable return on, um, on the nitrogen from a clover. And that's, I've done that two years in a row um, to be in that 250 bushel yield goal range and achieving that yield um, with a lot less fertility than what even I would recommend for somebody else on a conventional situation. Um, I'm thinking that a little bit later, Burton will talk of, uh, uh, some about uh, a similar system and, and some uh, savings on input. So, we, and we may come back to that if he doesn't. Um, uh, that the clover um i know we were you said just a few talking points i know we were talking about in a peanut rotation um one of the things that everybody i guess when i started really planting in clover and doing everybody said, oh the disease is going to kill you digging's going to be terrible i haven't seen any of those issues um and for single row hook together strip teal peanuts to be you know, consistently averaging 6,000 pounds irrigated with uh, reduced irrigation. I'm not saying that I won't run into a problem um, eventually um, with white mold or something, you know, in the clover, but I haven't had any problems yet. And I'm using a very, very <coughs> cost effective um, fungicide program. Um, as far as uh, I say peanuts, people ask me about digging. I think everybody's scared to dig peanuts and cover, but we haven't really had any trouble. Uh, they go, all the trash goes up the chain and falls right out and peanuts left on top and ready to go. Um, any other thing you can think of, Peyton? We, we may come back and, and uh, cover a few more things, but so yeah, just they've met Rocky and uh, why don't we why don't we move over as we're moving over to gains one thing that I probably should have told the participants is you know and, and I've told David this a bunch of times we we grow peanuts that's what we do in Georgia and uh, over here especially that's why I made that comment about being much like Southwest uh, that's what we do in our crop rotation and do in part because we're heavily irrigated we probably 65 percent of our row crop ground is irrigated <clears throat> uh, 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 corn, cotton, and peanut rotation is 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 perfect in regard to, you know, good good farming practices. So anyway, uh, just keep that in mind as we go through, and if you as you build questions, certainly, you know, that's what we'll come back to and focus on again. So Gaines, Gaines story, uh, his slides up here, and uh, we'll we'll let's hear from Gaines, and uh, uh, again we'll. We'll come back to certain points as we need to. You know, Gaines? Peyton right. said, I'm Gaines Story. Um, just a little bit about my background. I grew up on a row crop farm. Uh, you know, my dad put me to work when I was 12. I worked every summer for him from then all the way through college. Uh, we grew our cotton, corn, peanuts, like Peyton just said. Uh, I went off, went to the University of Georgia and graduated with a degree in ag business slash ag econ. Then I went back actually moved back to Waynesboro and uh, worked in ag lending for five years before going back to the farm, which I've been back on the farm full time for seven years now. <clears throat> you know, one thing I mentioned the ag lending thing because it gave me a great chance to see several different opportunities and operations. So, you know, we're a row crop farm. As Peyton said, we're very diverse. We've got all types of different management of row crop farms. We've got pecan farms. We've got uh, dairies. We've got cow calf operations. So it was a great get outside my bubble view of different operations. Um, on our operation, you know, my father and I uh, farm about 1600 acres combined. Of that, only about 40% is irrigated. So one of the main things that got me into cover crops was 
weed suppression and water sequestration. Um, especially because my first five years back on the farm, I didn't have any irrigated land. All I had was dry land. So that became very important to me, um, especially as I saw some of my neighbors that were heavily into cover crop. So what they were accomplishing in dry years compared to what I was. And then just seeing the weed suppression was the kind of icing on the cake for why I wanted to get into the cover crop experience. Uh, one thing, like my slide says, finding what works for us. My dad was uh, managing a farm in the early 80s, started farming full time in about 84. So he knows what lean times are like. So it was very important to find something that was economical and a good return on investment. And we could utilize equipment we already had. And through the years, you know, we've gone from cover crop on about 75 acres to this past year, we're about five to 600 acres. Now, not all of that is what I would call good cover crop, but it, it's a start. Um, and I do want to give a plug to our NRCS office on this point because for about three years, I was only doing about 75 acres of cover crop. And we were inside talking to some of our people at NRCS and they mentioned, hey, you know, there's some programs out there to really help you with the cost of seed and cost share and all. And that really propelled us to going to the next level with this. And now my ultimate goal is to have anywhere from 50 to 60 percent of our acres in cover crops. Um, and to keep watching Rocky with this planting green thing. So, <laughs> oh, hey, hey, Gaines. Yeah. While you, while you, since you brought that back up, there was a question in the chat box about in regard to, do you see any pest problems that result from planting in the green? So, Rocky, did you see any pest problems from that? Um, absolutely not. I didn't see any pest problems. I could see maybe um, in cotton or some other things, you might, we could, might could get some cutworms, might have some problems, but as far as any corn, I had absolutely no issues. Okay. Well, Gaines and I will go look this year when you plant. We're going to see. Okay. Thanks for answering that. Um, back to my thing about utilizing equipment we already had. As Peyton said, we have a lot of peanuts and we were already using uh, strip till rig with the planter hooked together on pretty much 90 acres, 90% 90 of our acres behind peanuts that were going to cotton or corn. So that got me to thinking, hmm, why don't we, you know, capitalize on this? And so if you'll go to my next slide, I believe that's the one that shows what we've accomplished with just, a, oh, sorry. That actually goes to the water sequestration. I have my, my uh, slides out of order in my mind. Um, I'll touch on that while I'm here. It's kind of hard to see in this picture, but obviously the picture on the left, you can see a lot more white than the picture on the right. And on the left is where we had a cover crop of oats. It was about 60, 65 pounds of oats, I believe. And just a little bit of uh, clover in there. The strip on the right was some strips I'd hair it out in between before planting just to get rid of the cover. And I call that a drought year. And even though that's a 600 pound field average, because that field or that farm averaged 600 pounds, a field about a mile up the road averaged 300 pounds. And farm about two miles up the road only averaged 250 pounds but that field with the cover crop uh managed 600 pounds and I firmly believe if I hadn't had the cover crop looking at that picture on the right I would have been in that 200 pound range so that really uh springboarded me into more and more cover as well because when you have a lot of dry land evening out those rough lean dry years is very important to your survival um if you'll go to my next slide now that's the one. We already had a, a particular stick strip till rig that had a, some row cleaners on the front. And so, you know, you see with cotton, we like a clean seed bed. Um, I like to narrow it off a little more than my father would. But, you know, right there, you can see we had a very thick cover. And after burn down and stripping, we had a great cover or a uh, great stand through all that and still left lots of residue in the middle. Uh, helps suppress weeds phenomenally in my experience, um, especially considering we're not using a roller at this point. Uh, that's, we're getting there, but right now with oats and clover, we've seen that uh, we don't really need that yet. I think it will be improved with rolling the cover crop, but uh, we're just utilizing what we have. Um, and one thing I'll say on this too, I like narrowing that seed bed up a little more um, than some people and not near as much as other people. But we've seen over about three years now that uh, 
after a packing rain, we have far less stand issues behind cover crops like this. That cover crop just kind of soften, softens up the soil and allows the cotton to push on through um, versus some places where we were just bedded and planted and we get a packing rain, we may have to go back out there and rotary hoe or replant. Um, so that alone is an added benefit that sometimes I think isn't considered when we're in the row crop, I mean, in the cover crop talk. Uh, and if you'll go to my next slide now for me. Gaines, one, hey, real quick, I want to say the other benefit you got with a cover like that in cotton is you're not going to lose any cotton to wind damage, and you're going to have very minimal thrips in your cotton as well at that point. That, um, that's a very good point. Scatter. And in fact, that's one thing I kind of like not having the roller because the way our tractors are set up in our planters, every middle except the one in between what I'm calling rows three and four is mashed down, but that one row kind of stands up a little more and actually provides a little extra wind break. And Rocky, you're exactly right. We've had fields, uh, irrigated field in particular, that one half the field, the wind blew sand and just decimated uh, Cotillion cotton and the quarter section where the cover crop was, perfect stand, no issues. Um, and now this slide is something, um, I pick on my dad sometimes and I know he picks on me, so it's all okay, don't worry about it. Um, my dad back in the late nineties and early two thousands was doing some two one skip row cotton in Georgia, much like what you see in other parts of the country, especially Texas. And we just kind of got away from it. We don't really know why, but <laughs> Uh, he kept talking about it when I was on the farm. I want to try it again because, you know, I can remember a couple of years where I had to mow down the conventional cotton, but my skip row, I didn't. Well, in 2019, we had a planter malfunction and two different fields. There was one row just missing all the way through. And all year as I was spraying, I just noticed how great the cotton looked on each side of that skipped row. So this year we tried skip row again for the first time. And now this is two 38 inch rows within a skip. So then we have a 76 inch gap in the middle. And as you can see, it uh, fruited out and had a very good yield, uh, a lot of white out there. We were fortunate to have good rain this year, but it's something I think can help maximize our return in the long term. And what I'm really interested to try with this is, uh, in fact, me and Peyton have been talking a good bit about this, coming in and trying to get a good cover crop seeded before we defoliate um, just so we can have that growing and established because one of the biggest challenges we have on our farm is getting our cover crop in on time. It's me, my dad, and one full-time employee trying to manage these 1,600 acres. And we're fortunate to have a couple part-time employees, but you know, my mom comes out and helps us pick peanuts. That's how shorthanded we are in harvest season because you're trying to get in 600 acres of peanuts and you know, anywhere from 800 to 1,000 acres of cotton all in the same time frame. It's often mid-December before we're done harvesting. And, you know, your equipment's tied up, so it's hard to break equipment free to plant cover crop. Um, your labor's tied up, breakdowns. So I really feel like this will give us an opportunity um, to just get in there a little earlier with our cover crop and get it established, with hopefully without uh, messing up too much of the established cotton crop. James, I was, I was looking back on what you text me as your uh, dry land yield on your skip row plots, and, and that was a uh, uh, thousand pound yield. We had two different varieties that did right at a thousand pounds, um, and then I had fields right around this that all averaged 900 to a thousand pounds conventional planting as well. Um, I did have one field, a 20 acre field of skip row that didn't do as well, it was more like 700 pounds, but I think that was more of a variety thing. Um, we, I've just noticed in the little bit I tried that uh, one variety just doesn't seem to do as good with skip row as the others. And so, uh, and did also, you, uh, yes, sir. Did, did you cut back on your seed, seeding rate per acre much at all? Or? I, yes, actually our seeding rate, if you go by a true per acre, um, we're at about 75, well, no, actually, we were about 85% uh, of normal seating rate. We bumped up our gear, so our spacing, in-row spacing was a little less. But overall, you're only planting, you know, 66% of the normal area you do. And that's one thing we want to look at long term is uh, around here, we've just been on 38-inch rows for a long time. Maybe 
dropping back and trying 30 inch rows with this thing. That way that our inner row spacing a seed can be stretched out a little more on our cotton. Um, and that's, I think that's one thing we do differently than what you'll see some research stations do, especially in Mississippi, they up their seeding rate drastically. They're planting the same amount of seed per acre a lot of times, or maybe only 5% less. And we were, you know, like I said, I, I had the math and I forgot to write it down, but I think we were about 80%, I believe, not quite three quarters total seed. Um, and one more thing on that, switching gears a little bit back to peanuts, but talking about getting the cover crop in early, that is one advantage of peanuts in Georgia. We have found that it works great to spread our cover crop seed out either prior to digging or prior to harvest of those peanuts because you just get the litter down there and some moisture to help establish uh, your seed. And we've had great success doing that, which to me kind of helps offset some of the drawbacks of having the, the tillage that's done by digging your peanuts. All right, and if you'll go to my next slide. And this, I just want to put this in there. Uh, there's lots of challenges with cover crops. Like I said, labor, time, cost, but there's also introduced pests. I mean, it can be feral hogs, it can be deer. They are attracted to this. And as you see on the left, I had a great stand of cover crop, but the hogs are still digging it up. Um, so all this isn't without its challenges. And it's just every challenge on, or there's cha different cha challenges on different farms. And I just want to put, point this out too, just that uh, there's not all pros to cover crops. There are some cons. It basically keeps these, this wildlife in the field pretty much year round at this point. And I think that's all I had. And if anybody's got any questions. Well, we, and we, again, we may circle back to some of these points. I didn't know uh, uh, if Jacob, uh, are, you, are you still on here? I see you there. I didn't know if you wanted wanted to say anything, but uh, I know you and Gain share uh, one common thing that, you know, you kind of came back to the farm and farming with uh, with the father that may, or may be more or less uh, prone to adopt some of the soil health principles and practices, but, but y'all are both doing it and doing a good job. Did you have anything, Jacob? He's looking at he's he's uh, looking at his screen, rolling his eyes probably. Okay, we'll let him off the hook. Well, I'll say on that. Uh, you yeah. know, my dad when I first went on, started down this path, he said I used to do cover crops. I used to strip till, and he was talking about strip tilling soybeans in behind his wheat crop. And yeah, that's better than nothing, but it wasn't the thought process I had. But I'll be honest with you, after the last two years, he's become a pretty firm believer in it. Um, it's still managing the time aspects of it you know getting our crops out is still our priority but he's come a long way on it uh, and I mean giving me great guidance too so okay um, uh, I think uh, next up uh, we had uh, Burton he, uh, if you want to switch over to those slides um, I I'll say this uh, in front of everybody Burton uh, Burton challenges me as much as anybody to, to think out of the box and, and did. And, and uh, one of the things uh, way back, not long after I got to Burke County, he, he invited me to go with him on a, a, a trip out to Kansas. And uh, he can tell you about that conference. But anyway, uh, uh, again, that just showed his commitment to, I think, cover crops and, and all the systems that are involved in, in management in soil health and and uh, implementing soil health practices on your on your farm. So uh, Burton's about Burton. Before you take off, uh, there was a question in the in the chat box. It, it says, uh, "Were there other varieties of clover, or other clover, or other cover crops that were used prior to what you finally settled on?" So I'm not sure who that applied to, whether that was Gaines or Rocky. But did you hear the question? You know, if it was towards me, we started with oats and, and crimson clover and AU robin kind of mixing just to try it out. Uh, we liked the idea that we didn't have to 
modifier planter to have a roller. And I've tried some rye and rye grass and three and four way mixes. Um, still for the ease of it and cost effectiveness, I still like my oats and clover because I can grow my own oats, put them in the bin, auger them into my full spreader or grain drill and, and then mix my clover in as I go. And uh, that's, that's what settled me on it. Plus if I can get into the cotton uh, time frame, I get some nitrogen benefit out of my clover as well. So, so that was for you gains. And then, and then uh, somebody else followed up with a question. It says, have you, have you tried any other clovers or legumes? I have not yet. Um, I, I have a field that I took over that <laughs> had volunteer white clover all over it. And honestly, I liked it a lot, but I haven't intentionally planted it yet. And then I uh, would like to try some hairy vetch as well, because I know our planter can go through it or our strip tillery can go through it. No problem. Uh, that's on the agenda at some point, but getting the acres I want in established the right way is priority for now. All right. So you guys keep those questions in mind. Um, I know Burton will cover some more of that. He'll touch on some other species and uh, and how the work goes in and why. And uh, we'll, all right, so Burton, let's let's go ahead and, and, and let you have it. Okay, well, uh, welcome to uh, everybody here and um, hope that, uh, hope that everybody's settled in. I'm looking at the clock here. I think I have about an hour. So uh, Peyton, is that all right? <laughs> <laughs> no. So, okay. So Burton for years has said we needed a soil health conference in Waynesboro. So maybe we're yet to have that. At that point, you can have your whole hour. Okay. Thank you. Yes. All right. So a uh, little bit, a uh, little bit about uh, myself, a uh, little history. My mom and daddy uh, got married December of 1967 and moved to Georgia and uh, started farming January of 68. Um, my daddy, one of the very first things he did was build a feedlot and I started contract feeding cattle for Gold Kist at the time. Um, he farmed conventionally just like everybody around him at that point. For probably the first, I don't know, maybe five to seven years, uh, he planted cotton, corn. Uh, I'm not sure if he planted any peanuts in the early days, but definitely corn and cotton and wheat and soybeans. And uh, as soon as it came out, uh, Brown Manufacturing out of Alabama came out with that first strip till rig. Uh, he bought one of the, it, I don't know if it was the first one or the second one, but I think that, uh, that my dad and also uh, local uh, uh, strip till and, and uh, regenerative farming pioneer Lamar Black, they each got one um, those first couple of strip till rigs and and stopped uh, hair and everything up and and bedding ahead of cotton and uh, so that was kind of the beginning of, of a transformation on our farm um, we have not always used cover crops like we do today however um, one of the early practices that we did and I say we, I'm just saying this in the farm sense. This is my daddy before my time, really. But uh, um, we'd get the airplane in. Uh, we'd bust bags of cereal rye and dump in the hopper. And we would fly cereal rye onto soybeans ahead of leaf defoliation to establish some, some early uh, grazing for cattle. Because that was, you know, it was a, a large feed savings. And we, as soon as we could turn those, uh, those cows out on pasture and supplement their income off of our silage based, uh, typical feed, uh, uh, program. So we did use covers in that sense. I don't believe we planted every acre in cover, just the acres that we could get cattle to. Um, in 2006, I was introduced to a fellow who was a, a researcher in the cover crop world, uh, Mr. Richard Petcher. Uh, formerly an Auburn Extension agronomist, and I planted my first cover that summer. Uh, the tillage radish was brand new. Um, I actually knew the fellow that that brought in the some of that earliest seed from New Zealand, and uh, we started in straight radishes as cover. Uh, where I planted those, my first opportunity was behind corn, so we harvested corn. 
Uh, we chop silage in July, but we also start harvesting, uh, start shelling corn in, in late July, uh, early August. And uh, so we've got a huge window of opportunity here in, in the Southeast. Um, could be 70, 80, even 90 days to a killing frost from the time that we harvest corn. And so there's all that opportunity to grow a, a really nice cover crop. So I planted radishes and uh, six pounds to the acre on today's market, that's you know probably eight or $9 worth of seed. Uh, so very, very economical. And uh, we planted wheat uh, following that uh, in the fall generally around 15th to the 20th of November. Um, I noticed how soft the ground was behind that cover crop of radishes. Uh, we had basically zero weeds. We burned down behind the combine and planted the radishes and had complete ground cover in 30 days. And I didn't see pigweed pressure. Uh, we got great nutrient scavenging, uh, get some nematode suppression. There's, there's so many things, there's so many roots in the ground, you get live living cover, uh, root exudates feeding soil microbes and just all of the opportunities there. And that was just with one thing, just with a, just with a crop of hybrid daikon radishes. And that really opened my eyes. Uh, when I went back into that same land, now, the next growing season with a strip-till rig, I could not believe how easy the strip-till rig pulled through there. Um, I really noticed how soft the ground was. And so that was, there were just a lot of things starting to converge there in my mind uh, in my first experience with uh, planting a cover crop, specifically for a cover crop, with no intentions of grazing it or harvesting it or anything like that. So... Uh, the next year I got sun hemp for the first, I believe that was 2007. And from that point on, I began with multi-species blends. I just added radish and, and uh, sun hemp together. And then um, the next year I started adding more. And, you know, typically now we plant eight to 12 species uh, normally. Um, before I go much further, just looking at the slide that's on the screen, uh, last year I did a little experiment. Um, that's a continuous no-till field where we don't do any subsoiling at all. And I had a, that's just a winter cover uh, behind of cotton uh, going back to corn. And if you look right in the center, lower of that picture, you can kind of see two drive pad, two, two little uh, slots, 30 inches apart, dead center. That's two rows. That's, that's the planter has already run through that. That, that has corn planted already and uh, worked out pretty nice, but, it really, uh, I'm going to go on record and say, if you're going to plant through something like that, you really need to roll it down. Um, doesn't necessarily need to be ahead of the planter, but could be a roller on the front of the planter, on the front of the tractor that's planting. But the reason for that is uh, it did shade it a little bit early on. Um, we did burn it down um, with Gramoxone pre-emerge on the corn. Um, but one of the important things that I'm starting to learn is, is as that cover crop starts to break down and, and die, it releases a lot of CO2. And CO2 is, I mean, that is plant food. And so if you can have a CO2 release of a decaying cover crop underneath the plant canopy of that next growing crop, whatever it might be, whether it's cotton beans, corn or whatever, there's a, there's a tremendous uh, response um, and capturing that CO2. So I believe moving forward, that's that's something we'll continue to work toward is, is getting everything rolled more, more flat on the ground, uh, which is, we had great weed control here, um, all of those things, but just being able to get that CO2 into the, into the, under the plant canopy, I believe would be important. So if we can move to the next slide, um, that's just, uh, this is, is winter cover. Um, uh, so it could be, we do have a fairly diverse rotation. We, we grow cotton, we grow peanuts, soybeans, corn, wheat, uh, occasionally a few other things, uh, canola, sesame, um, sorghum, but our primary five are, are the ones I mentioned first. And this is winter cover um, that we'll burn down and plant corn into. If you notice that right-hand slide, if you kind of lean in and, and look there, there's an earthworm hanging out of that, those roots, but that's, that's kind of a typical look at our 
at our soil uh, these days. Uh, we are we are coastal plain, uh, pretty sandy dirt, um, but it uh, it has a nice structure. We have really nice water infiltration, and uh, the cover really plays a big role in that. Bart, Bart, so, yes, sir. While you're on this picture, well, mm -hmm. one of the things I do as an agent for for the growers here, and I'm staying on our theme of uh, uh, soil health and the peanut rotation. Some of them are insistent that I have to go pull up their peanut samples. So Burton has tricked me into that from time to time. But <laughs> guilty. This, but this, <laughs> this is the. I will tell you that I can pull up. The, maybe not the same earthworm, but I can. And when I'm sampling for maturity in peanuts in his fields, I can pull, roll back the peanut vines. I can pull up for my sample, and I can find earthworms under the peanuts. Um, I bring this up one because I kind of came from that conventional mindset and when he started suggesting I needed to look for earthworms in in, in fields I, I you know of course not that I think Burton's off his rocker but you know I'm thinking hey what and so anyway folks we can we can achieve uh, I think we can be successful in this peanut rotation but the earthworm made me think of that Burton and I'm sorry if I got you off track no problem. Um, that is the beauty of it. We do uh, my best best uh, count. Uh, I like to take a uh, just a regular round point shovel out in the field from time to time, especially under cover, and uh, just dig a shovel full and just see what I see. And I, I have, you know, I don't know what's what's necessarily typical um, throughout all of our fields, but I've counted at least uh, sixteen to twenty on a round point shovel full. Um, uh, worth of worth of soil out of out of a field under low, under growing cover so uh, there is there is some really nice benefits out there of, of live roots all the time and diversity and minimizing disturbance and good rotation and all of those things but um, I went to Peyton mentioned uh, dragging him out to the uh, no-till in the plains conference in Kansas um, I went out there first uh, in uh, January of 2013 and uh, uh, it was, uh, I went at the recommendation of a friend because the focus that year was on cover crops. And that was really what I was passionate about. Uh, the whole no-till concept uh, really wasn't something at the forefront of my thinking. And in fact, if you'd have said, if you'd have told me to explain no-till, I probably would have said, well, I think we're kind of doing no-till, you know, we use a little strip till rig and all that, but actual continuous no-till with no, nothing touching the ground, except maybe a double disc opener, uh, was something I had really not even considered, but I, I ran smack into the wall of that uh, when I went to the No-Till in the Plains conference in 2013. And uh, so I, I came back kind of excited about, about taking it to another level and, and even minimizing disturbance more um, from a strip-till rig down to just running a planter without a strip-till rig, uh, no subsoiling whatsoever. So I do have, I do have some plots that um, are now uh, down the road pretty far. We've uh, the last tillage in my original plot was June of 2012 when we ran the strip till rig uh, ahead of the planter planting soybeans behind a wheat. So uh, we are we are looking at all of these things, and I still I <laughs> like Gaines and uh, and Jacob and some others. Uh, I farm with my 75 year old daddy who. Uh, in all actuality is a is a pioneer uh in the field of of biological health and farming uh in this part of the country uh, he has thought differently for for most of his time as a farmer and uh has always tended to err away from from the chemical answer uh to a biological answer if at all possible and that i stand on his shoulders as i have moved into this realm um, Connor, if you can move to the next slide. Um, so winter cover, there's strip till corn on the left. Um, we, uh, we still do some strip till. We do some continuous no-till. Um, if, it's, uh, if it's up to me, we'll, we'll continue to do more continuous no-till. If it's up to my daddy, we'll probably hang on to the strip till rig a little longer. I don't know. We're, we're in constant debate about that. Peyton has a little experience with how all that goes. Uh, I'm not going to say that all heat walls are hard headed, but uh, at least me and my daddy. Um, 
I, I mentioned it earlier about my first cover crop experience uh, planting cover behind corn uh, in uh, in the summertime. And I, so I'm just going to kind of roll through a little bit of our rotation here uh, in slides. So um, I'd love to put 100 slides in here and, and really went through it step by step, but I tried to just catch a little bit of the bright spots. So we planted corn. That first slide was no-till corn. And then this one here, we've got strip-till corn. So after corn's harvested, um, the slide on the right is, uh, is a multi-species cover blend planted behind a corn. Um, and if you roll to the next slide, um, that's the same field. Um, the one on the left is 30 days from planting and the one on the right is probably more like 60 days. Um, so you can really grow a jungle uh, of cover in that time frame. We have so much heat and long growing days, sunshine, and, and typically do get a decent amount of rain in that time frame, uh, primarily in heavy thunderstorms where we might get those one to three inch rains uh, come hard and fast uh, in, in less than an hour. Um, and that's where the cover just absolutely shines because we have no runoff, we have no washes. Uh, after tremendous rainfall events, our ditches, uh, our ponds are clean. Um, with having exposed soil and a heavy rain event it is just an absolute it's one of the most destructive things to, to topsoil that I can think of. And we did some tests here on water infiltration and it's been several years ago, but I know the one of the fields we tested, uh, I think our ranges were right around six inches an hour on our infiltration rates. And we went across the, went across the, a field road to a field that's farm conventional by, by a neighbor. And uh, his was more like a quarter of an inch. And so with exposed soil and only being able to take in a quarter inch an hour, you get a three inch rainfall event, two and three quarter inches is gone and it's taking the phosphorus and the potash and, and the, the uh, organic matter and floating it down, down the creek. And whereas ours is going for moisture uh, into the bank for the next crop. Burton. <clears throat> yes. Burton. So uh, well, well, one thing I want to make a point, um, you know, we're, we are, we have to, had to deal with uh, resistant weeds, pig, uh, uh, Palmer amaranth, namely, um, for some time. And I will say that uh, this works wonders in that regard. Uh, a quick, uh, maybe herbicide shot right after corn harvest, uh, planting this, and you're you're right. Have, you want to? I mean, you've had no pigweed issues from end of july till you know frost and uh, that's correct that's so, correct this no go ahead well and, and that, i just i just wanted to make that point but the other question have you seen organic matter or have you tested organic matter levels have you do, you know documented that they're going up i know well, you can see it and you but have you tested any and are they going up on your farm they are. Uh, they're not going up as fast as I'd like to see, and that's one of the things that I'm working on currently is um, how to build organic matter faster, and it's all tied to plant root exudates. And uh, basically, um, I believe that if we, based on some of the newer data I've seen and, and working with some people that are pioneering in this field, uh, one of them being John Kempf out of Ohio, uh, he, uh, he's doing some tremendous work in, in speeding up um, the, the plants. Uh, basically, I'm, I'm having trouble explaining it, but by increasing plant health, um, we're increasing organic matter faster through, through better root exudates. Um, so uh, I've not tested every year. Uh, in fact, honestly, we don't soil sample very often. Um, kind of counter, kind of counterintuitive on that. Maybe uh, we used to soil sample regularly, you know, many many years back. But honestly, after a number of years of of farming in this in this uh, manner, we just don't see we see very few changes in our in our soil sampling. I'm all, um, 
I'm going to stop uh -huh. you on that one because uh -huh. that's the responsible extension agent thing to do when you say don't <laughs> soil sample. And didn't two, say that. And two, <laughs> so no, you had, there's a question in the chat box that I'd rather you talk about. So, okay. so I'm going to, the, the question is, have you, have you run any soil health samples on these fields? And then the statement before that was that they, they loved your, your concept about the CO2 rise uh, from the decay of biomass, et cetera, and how that would, would work and should work. So have mm -hmm. you run specifically soil health samples? I have not. Um, and that's something that, that I'm, I'm trying to implement for this growing season to, to start to, I've been doing this type of a, of a program now for at least 10 years, kind of in the, in the way we're doing it currently. Uh, it took us a number of years to kind of step up to this point, but farming now, as we have farmed for about the last 10 years, I have not really cataloged what has all changed other than, than uh, trying to be an astute observer and, and seeing what, what changes visibly and in yields and, and decreased inputs and decreased weed pressure and all of those things. But um, I, I want to really try to catalog from here forward, um, partnering with a few others perhaps um, to, to develop some protocols and, and sample every year and even behind uh, behind specific crops to see what the impact has been of specific covers versus others. So um, I, was, I, I was getting there painting on the soil samples. I, I was want to go on record and say, I'm, I'm not at all saying don't use soil samples. Uh, just saying that uh, we, we don't see many changes, pH levels, fertility levels. Uh, the, our fertility levels continue to, to slowly increase over time. Uh, and that's due to increase, increased soil organic matter. And the last time we did some checks on organic matter, um, uh, you know, typically in our part of the world in a full conventional tillage system, uh, Peyton, you could uh, agree or disagree. I, I believe probably around the county, it's probably around a half percent organic matter on, on our type of soil. That's about right. Um, you have another, there's another question that says, are you sap testing instead? So I have sap test kits on the way to me right now that uh, I'm about to do some sap tests on wheat, uh, plant sap test, sap tests versus tissue samples where they actually uh, extract the, the sap from the plants um, that goes overnight or next day or whatever to the Netherlands to a, a pretty incredible new testing facility where we get in real time what that plant is actually moving. Um, and then we can respond to it in that manner, which is a little, it's, it's more quicker and more detailed, uh, than, uh, than tissue analysis. So SAP testing is, is part of the, part of the future here, but, um, back to the resistant pigweed thing, where did, the Palmer the question hmm? is, where did you get that equipment from that SAP testing equipment? So uh, I mentioned John Kempf out of Ohio. I was trying to remember the name of the company. You can Google that up. It's advancing eco agriculture aea advancing eco agriculture look that up those are the folks working with the plant sap tests okay um resistant palmer amaranth probably our number one challenge over the last 10 years in weed control in the southeast and uh that sun hemp that you see blooming on the right hand side that's also uh the kind of leafy sort of it's kind of a distant kissing cousin to marijuana. Don't get any ideas, but uh, in the hemp family there, but it, it grows so fast uh, from a clean start. It will truly outgrow a pigweed. Um, they're neck and neck. In fact, the pigweed leads and plant height at about 15 days from emergence. If there's some pigweed out there that comes up when you plant after burn down uh, at 30 days, they're pretty much neck and neck about knee high, but at 60 days, the sun hemp's eight feet tall and the pigweed is down there curled up underneath completely shaded out and where we've walked and checked uh cover at 60 days we've never found pigweed under that cover that actually made seed so uh, we consider it the best biological uh suppressant of of uh resistant palmer amaranth that's available and uh and and that specific species right there stun hemp uh at a 20 pound rate 
will make something in excess of 150 units of nitrogen in that 60 days. So there's some tremendous fertility options there too. But in early years, I used it by itself. Now I put it in, in a multi-species blend as one of the main workhorses in the blend. But I uh, really feel like that one of those principal keys of soil health, uh, the biological diversity is, is uh, incredibly important. So buckwheat, sun hemp, field peas, millet, mung beans, you know, brassicas, radish, kale, mustard. There's so many options and we like to put as much diversity in now as we can. Uh, moving through the slides, let's, uh, let's kick on over to the next one. Uh, so what we follow that cover behind corn is with wheat, uh, winter wheat, as you see on the right. And you see, it's not just really, really pretty. You get some of those little sun hemp stalks sticking up in the air. It kind of looks like it's a kind of a mistake field, but we don't mind it because it, uh, in the end, time the wheat's ready to harvest, uh, it all goes through the combine and makes no difference to the combine at all. Uh, but that's no-till wheat. Uh, on the left is a slide of no-tilling that wheat through, through that cover, um, you know, sometime in, in uh, mid-November. Uh, if you can move to the next set of slides, what we typically plant behind a wheat is soybeans. Um, the slide on the left, obviously beans, but uh, on the right would have been where we have a, a center pivot split in half, uh, the north half, uh, was in soybeans behind the wheat. The south half there was corn that had been harvested and planted to cover. And you just see time we get to harvest in October to harvest those beans behind wheat. Uh, we've already got all that beautiful cover behind the corn crop and we'll follow our soybeans as we will also in that same time slot, our peanuts or our cotton uh, that will all get a multi-species uh, wintertime blend uh, to go ahead of corn. Next slide, please. So here's planting some cotton in, in pretty heavy residue. Uh, on the left is strip till cotton, which uh, the last couple of years we planted. Um, yeah, the bulk of it is, is strip till uh, still, but on the right is a slide of, of true no-till cotton. And uh, the last two years we've planted no-till test strips. Um, it has done really well in comparison. I uh, have not seen a yield drag. Um, we kind of lost some data. Uh, was it two years ago? We had the Hurricane Matthew deal and it, the wind, the excessive winds pulled some, some mature cotton out of the plant onto the ground, but uh, don't know how those yields compared. Although the best cotton we actually picked was in the no-till strip, but that might've been a timing issue, not anything to do with no-till versus strip till. Uh, next slide, please. Just some more little cotton coming out of the ground on the left and then more uh, heavy vegetative growth a little later in the season. I believe that's about, uh, that's late August uh, there on the right there at the headquarters. Uh, next slide, please. And then cotton at harvest on the left. Uh, last year, our cotton averaged a little over 1,700 pounds. This year, we were off significantly uh, more in the 1,300 pound range. Um, on the on the right there, um, so we actually flew, uh, we dropped back to some old habits. We've been experimenting a little more recently with flying on cover uh, aerially. Um, we typically take a 30 foot no-till drill and plant all of our cover. Uh, I prefer a drill uh, for, for the same reason we would prefer to plant uh, a cash crop with a with a planter or a drill to get uniform, uh, you know, uniform seeding, um, nice, nice, clean uh, soil contact. And, uh, but uh, on the right there, that's uh, out the bottom of our feed lot. And so we flew on some seed for the first year in a long time over cotton ahead of defoliation. And as the picker was running away from me right there, I just snapped that shot to show you what the cover was already, how well it was already established. Uh, so now we have cattle grazing on that. Uh, next slide, please. Hey, hey Burton. Mm -hmm. Sure. Uh, real quick before you go uh, into that, uh, mm -hmm. two things you you mentioned, you're talking about your cotton, you're talking about your yields, and you had mentioned, made a statement earlier um, about planting uh, certain species in your cover, maybe to help on nematode issues. Mm -hmm. And we know, I, I'm just bringing up, you, 
you know that you still have pressure from uh, plant parasitic nematodes in your cotton. In fact, you can, as an agent, right, we, I can see it. You can see that. Yet you're still maintaining uh, quite good yields, excellent yields. And so I'm, I'm just making that statement that when you, when you say give suppression, I, who knows how much? I don't know. I think there's still a lot of work to be done on that. That was one mm -hmm. thing. And, and I don't know that there's an answer there. But the other thing I think you might can answer, somebody put in the chat, what organic matter percentage do you have on the farm in your soil organic matter? Um, the, it, it ranges, but I think the best we saw was around two and a half. Um, so, so to, uh, to, to Peyton's point about, uh, about nematodes, I'm still not even sure, um, where I'm going to land, uh, as far as nematodes are, are concerned. And I know that's a tremendous, uh, 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 important topic across the Southeast, across cotton growing areas as well, uh, nematode pressure and, um, Dr. Adamir Caligari did one of his uh, PhDs. Uh, he did some nematode research work at the experiment station there at University of Georgia, just south of us, about six or seven miles in the 80s. He said that we have uh, somewhere around 90 species of nematodes that are native to our soil, but due to excessive tillage and, and fumigants, et cetera, et cetera, we've basically killed off everything but the the good handful of ones that are the toughest and roughest, the one to do the most damage. And our beneficials have been wiped out primarily. Now they're still around, but they're in the fence row. They're in the tree belt along the edge of the field. Um, and I'm, I have seen other parts of the country where they have went into farming practices like this. And as time has went by, their beneficial nematodes have come back, uh, even possibly some places have been reintroduced and I have actually reintroduced some beneficial nematodes uh, into our soil. And I feel like that if we can get our nematode populations, our, our beneficials back up, that that will help with keeping our parasitic ones in check. So that's my theory. Don't say the county agent sanctioned that, but. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I still look for them every time I come out and I ain't seen a good one yet. <laughs> you might need a microscope. Uh, anyway, uh, we can we can move to the next slide. Um, just a, a little bit of an example more of that of that summertime grown multi-species blends. Um, next slide, please. There we go. We've got some cattle grazing on on covers. Uh, that's behind the corn there. Um, on the right, we've got some strip till peanuts. We do plant 30 inch uh, strip till peanuts. Uh, typically do plant in a fair amount of residue and do love that. Um, peanuts. I wanted to take peanuts out of the rotation when I got back from the no-till conference because I said, well, a, a, a peanut digger is a pretty excessive tillage tool, but over time and a little bit of uh, uh, a little bit of thinking and a little bit of uh, uh, paternal uh, input, uh, we have left peanuts in the rotation. Uh, uh, won't probably grow them when they're at the loan rate, but uh, at $450 or $500 a ton. It is a true economic uh, opportunity for, for us. Our, our typical peanut yields over the last eight to 10 years uh, with, a, with a reduced uh, fungicide spray program. And I, honestly, there have been numbers of years we've sprayed zero insecticide on peanuts. I know we sprayed uh, one insecticide a couple years ago. I don't remember if we sprayed any in 2020 or not. Uh, but we typically use very, very little insecticide. Um, but uh, we have been running around 6,000 or a little better pound averages uh, on, our, on our 30 inch peanuts strip till. Uh, next slide, please. So just uh, that's some peanuts from this year. Again, they're 30 inch, they're pretty close together. Um, I believe, uh, Gaines talked about uh, about putting out seed ahead of uh, either digging or ahead of running the harvester. And uh, we did some of both this year, kind of did some tests. Um, on the right hand, you see us loading uh, with a seed tender, loading loading a cover crop blend into the, into the airplane. 
Uh, we flew over these peanuts. Some of them were already inverted, just due to the timing of getting the airplane, and some were not. Uh, we actually we prefer to to spread on peanuts before we invert them. Uh, just feel like we get you get nice. You've got moist soil underneath, and they shake out nice, and and puts cover on top of them, and sifts dirt over top of that seed. Um, does a really nice job of getting cover started. The the only issue that that you could be concerned about perhaps is if we ran into wet weather and it stayed damp, stayed damp for weeks and weeks and weren't able to harvest and your cover got up bigger and and bigger where you actually had green cover coming out the top of your windrows. Uh, we actually have had that happen, uh, but we still didn't notice any problems uh, with running the harvester, even with that green cover coming up through the vines. Uh, probably what we did do is lose a little bit of stand under the row because some of some of those small plants got pulled out by the roots uh, with the pickup fingers on the on the peanut harvester. Uh, next slide. So that is that exact same field uh, from a different angle that you saw the peanuts inverted in. That's the cover we flew on ahead of the digger. Uh, and that's I took that. I don't know, maybe uh, sometime this week, I believe. Um, so we've been grazing that now for for quite some time, and and cows uh, cows have really nice uh, weight gain and and condition on on uh, on a multi species blend like that, and they're pulling they're pulling the residual nitrogen left over from the peanuts and and uh, making us a really nice cover, and we uh, really feel like that uh, that helps to further us down the road uh, quite a bit on our soil health gains by being able to put cattle out there on the land. Uh, I was in Kansas at the no-till conference two years ago. Dr. Joel Williams uh, threw a statistic out that I was not familiar with that blew my mind actually. He asked a question, how much of what goes in the mouth of the cow comes out the back? And in, in, a, in a manner of speaking, what he's asking was how much of the actual daily intake of that cow does it take what percent of the intake does it take to drive the weight gain or the milk production um, and how much comes out the back in pure uh, biologically active uh, organic matter and the answer is around 10 percent and so if a cow eats a uh, 100 pounds of cover and kicks 90 90 pounds of it out the back in pure biologically active organic matter um, that is nothing but speeding up uh, soil, uh, organic matter and health, uh, increases. And so, uh, we, I, I would probably don't tell anybody, but I'd probably feed somebody's cattle for free to get them out on the field. If, uh, if I didn't have my own, just because I, I believe in what they do and improving soil. There was some additional uh, research done here by our, uh, forage specialist. And, uh, he, they decided that the rate of carbon return to the system in a grazing system like this is like five times normal rate, if that makes sense. So anyway. Yes. Yeah. Essentially they're processing uh, a lot of that cover uh, for you and breaking it down uh, tremendously faster and throwing it back on the ground. And not only is it, is it high in, in some of the things that we, we lack uh, most crop rotations, especially in, in uh, conventional systems and, uh, are inherently bacterial in nature. They're very high bacterial counts and extremely low, if any, fungi. And a true healthy soil for a production system typically would be more of a one-to-one -one, uh, fungi to bacteria uh, ratio. And that's tremendously out of whack, which is part of our weed pressure and other things. So cattle in the system, uh, the beneficial fungi uh, restart is, is a big benefit in this situation. I'm not sure where my slide set is. Uh, do we have some more there yet? I think that might be the last one. Yeah, yep, that's that it. Works. Okay, so uh, I'll, I'll probably, uh, let me just wrap up with this. Um, one of the things that you won't see driving by fields at, at Sunshine Place Farms is you won't see washes in fields. Um, we have, we have some rolling land, uh, nothing compared to what some people farm, uh, but we don't have washes. Uh, I said it before, if you see water leaving the field, which is extremely rare, um, 
it will be clean water. It won't be muddy. It won't look like chocolate milk in the ditches. Uh, we have quite a bit of drain towel under, under some of our, some of our fields. Um, but, uh, we essentially have zero runoff. And so, uh, with, with rotation, with live roots all the time, with good biological diversity, uh, moisture management is, is a really big part of that. Um, and we have a lot of heat late in the year. We have a lot of heat in the middle of our growing season. And I have seen, uh, satellite imagery from, from, uh, NASA, uh, showing bare soil versus soil under a living cover in Kansas in the middle of summer. And that temperature swing is 50 degrees. It was, uh, no, 60 degrees. It was 80 degrees under the, under the cover soil surface temp. And the bare soil was 140. Yeah. So just from evaporation and everything else, uh, cover really does, really does help us out. Burton, uh, uh, several things here one if, if connor if you don't mind uh, make sure that anthony black's slides are up next there's i think there's just three and uh there was in the chat box uh somebody typed have evaluated the impact of livestock grazing on soil compaction under conservation agriculture because it's known that this practice is one of the main causes of soil degradation so, so i'm not exactly 100 percent sure what um, what, that's all I can see in the box. Uh, I don't know that I've missed some if I've missed something there or what, but um, so so uh, if you want to clarify that, if you if you if you type that in there, you, you may want to may want to do so because I'm not sure where you if that was a question or a statement. Um, uh, if it's okay, Burton, uh, you, you want to type your email address in the chat box. Okay. Uh, somebody I'll was asking for that. that. And then sure. um, let's go ahead to Anthony's slides. Let me introduce Anthony Black. Anthony is the uh, Southeast Research and Education Center for UGA. It, he's the superintendent. And uh, um, when I was introduced to Anthony, our district director was uh, bringing me here for the first time, and he said, "He's Anthony's just just starting here on the station, and uh, you guys are going to get along well." That was kind of how he left it, and uh, he was right. And um, I have a lot of respect for Anthony and what he does to help us in the regard to research there. But uh, Anthony, that's all I'm going to say, and uh, we, we, let's hear from Anthony Black. Okay, Peyton. Uh, thank you for that introduction, and I'm. Um, I was told as long as I did what Peyton Sapp wanted to do, I'd, I'd make it in Burke County. So oh, that's funny. Okay. <laughs> uh, as Peyton said, I'm superintendent here at the Southeast Research and Education Center in Midville, Georgia. We're located in the southwest part of Burke County. We're about as far from one end of Burke County as you can get. So uh, without being, without running out of the county, we're right on the Gitche River. Uh, we're on this upper coastal plain land formation in Georgia. So we're predominantly sandy type Tifton soils. Uh, we have uh, have some redder areas hard, uh, ground where we, of course is eroded soil from over the years. So we deal with a lot of varying soil types in this part of the world, probably um, on this farm really from one end to the other, we vary. If you don't like the soil type you're in, walk 50 feet a lot of times. So um, as being manager here, we, we tend about 400 acres of actual crop ground. Um, Cotton, corn, peanut, soybeans are our biggest crops we're, we're looking at doing research on. And I do some conventional tillage, some strip tillage, some continue uh, true no-till. So we do a little bit of it all here. Uh, as I told Peyton before, I get to experience the bad parts of all of it. So uh, and working with Peyton, that was one of the things we were, this part of the world has seen a, a lot of emphasis on cover crops and particularly strip tillage over the years. Uh, yeah, I've heard uh, uh, Burton mentioned a while ago, Lamar Black. I'm actually Lamar Black's nephew, so I've I've been familiar with his operations for years growing up, watching what he was doing on his farm, uh, watching what a lot of people in this area have done over time. So uh, as part of Peyton, I'll talk a little bit more to it here in a little bit, but we actually started a long-term project four years ago 
uh, with Peyton to kind of, as well as Jefferson County and Jenkins County extension to address maybe some long-term needs with the cover crop. Uh, I think as all of you will find out as you start, I think it's one of these systems that the longer you stay in it, the better you are. Uh, it improves with time and then we want to be able to measure those improvements. And so devoting some area to a long term where we can kind of gain, you know, gauge those increases or decreases over time and see what we run into. I think that's going to be a valuable tool in this area as well as state and nationally. So I'm, I'm looking forward to working with Peyton on that. Um, we've got some specialists in on board with it, and we've got a lot of things we want to do there. And I think you have to have a long-term, larger scale area set aside to, to capture some of that data. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we tend about 400 acres. Uh, as part of this doing research, I'm also cha challenged with, I have to pay my way here on the station. So uh, whatever's not in research, we're actively farming and trying to make a somewhat of a profit off of, if you can call it that, but we have to pay the bills. So as part of that, um, paying the bills, I, I look for ways to, to save money um, and to pr improve our land. So I've gone to a lot of my cotton is probably 75% of my, out of my, 75 of my cotton acreage, which we grow roughly 200 acres every year is, is in conservation tillage behind a cover crop. And, Talking to that, if you'll swap sides, this is corn here planted behind a rye cover, but if you'll swap to the next slide, I think you'll see uh, that's predominantly how we plant now in our rye cover. We're strip tilling. Uh, I have another slide here with a roller on it uh, just, for, just for the sake of mentioning. We used to roll and predominantly I rolled where I could spread fertilizer. I spread all my fertilizer pre-plant. Pre uh, just because that's kind of how we do things with a lot of our research trials. So I do it on production land as well. And I needed a way to, you know, I thought maybe the tallness of the rye was maybe in, inhibiting the spreading of the fertilizer. But since, you know, we've gone to these vector type high clearance fertilizer spreaders now. And so we're able to get over the top of the cover. So we've gone away from this rolling. If you'll swap back to the previous slide, we strip and run our roller on the rear now which I think does a pretty good job, not only lays the cover over, but we're also anywhere we may have a clay gall or some hard dirt that tends to blow out. We're kind of busting those clods back and firming that seed bed back down. So I've been pretty pleased with this, this we're, uh, way we're doing things now. And we, we do everything in separate passes as far as planting and stripping. And part of that's because I have one planter here that kind of has to do conventional duty as well as conservation tillage duty. So. We, we don't, we do not gang them together. Um, I know Burton's a fan of the, the multi-mix species. Uh, me, I, I think they're a good way to go, but from what I'm doing, rye has been my choice. We pretty much all our cover is cereal grain uh, rye. So uh, we have a lot of experience and to me, that's been the easiest to manage. So if, if you're a new grower that's kind of looking at getting into this, uh, I guess a lot of my land is like I'm starting over every year because we have conventional systems as well. So I don't really have any land outside of a specific research project. Uh, but most of my stuff is, you know, changing tillage practices every every year. So the rye has been the pretty much the easiest thing for me to handle and it, with my equipment. Um, but Peyton, is there anything I've, I've missed? No, no, that that's fine. That's good. Uh, I wanted to I wanted uh, uh, participants to understand kind of our relationship, mine from uh, extension and yours from research, but yet the kind of the working together on things. Uh, I think that's uh, somewhat different than we have in some places. I don't know. Um, I guess uh, if if you don't mind, Connor, we'll we'll put up the slide set that I had. Thank you for that. Uh, I don't know really um, how many, how much explanation I want to do. So, so you guys, let's let's use as I'm talking through these nuances with the my few examples. Uh, if, if any of our speakers previous to me have points or, or things they want to interject, now is your time to kind of do the way I, I, I guess I did with you. Um, I mentioned that that uh, I, I was in a way picking on Burton, but in, in, in 
one way also giving him some credit uh, uh, so you can write that down Burton that that uh, you know as I've got to be the agent here you know there's a lot of people that are uh, have done some type of soil health practice mainly cover cropping on their farm and then there was there was this whole in my mind there were more questions than there are answers um, we in our area have a tremendous variation in our soil types. I think everybody says that in the whole world that farms, but if, but if you, in the bottom right of this slide, that's um, a map made from running a Varus rig uh, in, our, in the half of the pivot, we have our long-term cover crop rotation in. And so that, that this variation, uh, these questions and, and issues that come up with the challenges of planting in the cover, um, which cover species is ideal. All of these things were in my mind when we tried to lay out this particular study. And I wanna see how long it takes to get this system working. So this is the fourth year uh, that we've been allowed to utilize uh, this half of a pivot there at the experiment station. We have, and, and I'll, if you'll go to the next slide, let me explain the how it's laid out you can see this um from left to right uh in the in the pivot we we have four different treatments uh, uh rye clover treatment instead of reading that red as conventional let's read that as no cover um then we have a rye treatment and a mixed cover crop species uh, uh treatment and those were randomized and laid out across that half of the pivot um, the plots are 12, uh, they're 12 row plots. Um, it's, it's essentially 20 foot wide. And the shortest one I think is about 400 feet and the longest one, maybe six. Anthony, I could be a little off on that, but these are larger block plots. And I think that's important too, when you're looking at some real world, world differences in cover crops and how we treat them and how we manage them. Um, so, so let's go over, let's go to the next slide. That's the, can you move my slide to the next one, please? So here's that Varus map now drilled down to where those cover crop treatments are. And you, you can see uh, quite a bit in, of, of variation in the, in the soil EC numbers. As we look back on the three years worth of data in essence, that has been the difference right now versus cover crop treatments. Another way to say that is, I think that there's a lot of value in either of those three cover crop treatments and they help to improve, yes. But in the span of three years, given this variation in soil type, you can't prove that one is any different than the other or contributes more or less than the other. That's my take on my three years worth of uh, my corn in the first year, uh, peanuts in the second year, and then the third year was in cotton last year in the cash crop. So anyway, uh, soil variation has made it harder for us to quantify for growers what changes we can make, or at least in the short term. Okay, so let's, go to, let's go to the next slide. Oh, I left that in. I, I was going to take it out. So I knew somebody would ask me, Burton, what was the, that was my reminder of what we put as a mixed species cover. So you can go ahead and go to the next one. Now I'm not shortchanging that and I'm not uh, wanting to skip over it. We can come back. I think that the point here is for um, what I can encourage as a county extension agent for people who want to get into um, emphasizing soil health principles and practices. Uh, planting a cover crop is the first thing you need to get good at. And if you're gonna do that, you need to look at, how, you need to try to produce the most biomass you can produce. All this, uh, that will be dependent maybe on what your goals are, but biomass and then which species do I use to, to gain a nitrogen credit, if you will. So this, this uh, is data that we took before we planted corn, just as we uh, terminated the cover crop ahead of the first year of corn that we put in this long-term cover crop study. So we achieved some relatively uh, high levels of biomass, if you will, from each of the 
three treatments. And we can get into specifics if anybody wants to know on, you know, uh, planting rates and that of each of the covers. But everything achieved a, a high level of biomass. That was good. And then uh, obviously rye doesn't return the nitrogen back to that system. Go ahead to the next slide, if you will. So this was the, the uh, second season of cover crops in my, so this would have been um, 2000 and would have grown during the uh, fall of 2018. And this is in this over the same treatments in the same places, but this would be where we terminated ahead of planting peanuts. And these were are our bio, biomass levels on the line there in the red numbers. And then um, also the, uh, the, we run a nitrogen calculator. So we, this is the return for each of the species back in nitrogen. Um, so I'm probably trying to rush through and not making good sense, but it, but essentially, you know, again, for me, making biomass is the key for cover crops, for weed suppression, maybe for that water holding capacity, maybe increasing, and, uh, and then maybe trying to return that organic matter. And if you want nitrogen, you better pay attention to your species selection. Um, before we leave this slide, I'll say this, the, I don't have a slide made or a graph made exactly like this for what we did ahead of the cotton. But let me give you my, the, the, our three-year average on biomass production for the rye clover was 6,907 pounds. That's dry matter biomass. The three-year average across plots for the mixed species covers uh, was 6,355. And then um, for the rye, the biomass production was 6,201 dry matter pounds of biomass. So, you know, you can look at all kinds of research out there and you can, you know, there's it's such a dynamic system. I'll make two statements. Our, our weed scientist is really a firm believer in rolled rye and getting, that's that's his cover of choice and that's what you know does the thing for him. He has his specific reason, weed control. But I can, sh but my numbers, what we're seeing is that you can actually produce a little more biomass with something else, a mixed species cover, be it rye clover or be it a, a, a six way mix as Burton is in favor of. So, you know, there's, there's a lot of ways to uh, in my opinion, achieve success. And we'll come back to that in a minute. So um, uh, will you go to the next slide for me? We're concerned about stand counts and that kind of thing. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and move to the next slide. Just know that here, uh, your no cover blocks, it's easy to achieve that stand count that is why I'll say optimum. You got to plan and think and be on your game if you're going to utilize cover crops and not affect your stand count. Okay, that's that's what I gather from this information, from what we're seeing in our cover crop study. I think that's a no-brainer. These guys have already shared with you ways to be successful planting into green, planting into heavy cover that's that's terminated ahead of time. It, that's doable. I'm just saying you got to be on your game to do it right. Will you move to the next slide? So that was a picture of our long-term cover crop study. I think it's uh, it is representative of our crop rotation and um, eventually maybe if this thing can run for nine years or 12 years or however long, I think we'll have more answers for cover crop systems in Burke County. But again, the system is so dynamic until th th that, that study on my farm is gonna look different even eight miles up the road where Burton's farming potentially, right? So we can customize uh, the principles and practices to fit what you're doing. We, and we gotta know that as, a, as a extension educators, I think that's a, so important to stress. Let's focus on your goals and what you want from a cover crop system from emphasizing your soil health principles. All right, the next thing that I wanted to show you 
I would I would be remiss if I didn't talk about um, some of the some of the old guys, so to speak, who have who were I think the words you guys used earlier were pioneers of cover cropping. So that so this is uh, uh, Dr. Alton Walker and just a synopsis of what he's been trying to do for these number of years. Uh, he he is has been extremely successful at getting crimson clover to reseed. He is a he is in a cotton and peanut rotation basically. He's 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 a, a non-irrigated farm. That's that's what he's is. And um he loves desperately loves to tinker on equipment. But but I think the take home message about him and his cotton production system is he is certainly at a, at a high return on investment uh, grower here. He, he, he puts very little um, upfront dollars into his crop. His yields will rival anybody's in the county in, in dry land production. And he is a firm believer in soil health principles and practices. Um, he, he has, I guess in the last five years, y'all may have to correct me if I'm wrong, He's basically converted to all no-till and um, remaining successful. So he had his, his strip-till rig still in place. But anyway, this is kind of his system, what you see on the screen. And uh, it's outstanding. He'll have to intercede uh, ryegrass or rye into his clover. But um, so he's kind of multi-species. He's uh, not usually mow the cotton stalks till late. He's uh, He emphasizes uh, beneficials and that kind of thing. And the question that was asked earlier about planting into this type of cover and planting kind of green into it, you know, and, and, and insect pressure or pest pressure, the only problems he's had in his system really to amount to anything to where he's had to rely on insecticides has been grasshoppers in his cotton. And uh, otherwise he doesn't, very little reliance on uh, commercial herbic uh, insecticide or fungicide. So again, if y'all have something you want to say about that, fine. But I wanted to bring up uh, Alton in that. And I'll say one thing on that, the reseeding cover crop. Actually, probably the best cover crop I ever had was naturally reseeded. It was something I didn't plant until I didn't even burn down the cover crop until end of May. Just as an experiment, it was only 75 acres. And the following year it naturally reseeded and it was uh by far the best cover crop i've ever had now that's not practical on a large scale especially with our climate but you know doc goes out there he he just kills the little strips and leaves uh leaves some strips reseeding for clover i don't think he's getting rye and oats and rye grass to reseed yet which is that, that's probably cool. not a bad thing long term for resistance management but uh for the clover it, it works very well he farms right next to me and i've seen it year in and year out and it works very well Yes. So, so anyway, if, if there's an interest in that, somebody can contact me. That's fine. And, and Dave, I know, David, we're, we're needing to move on to Archie, but um, I'll, I'll use this slide also to say there's there are a number of projects that I'm involved in right here in the county where growers are uh, emphasizing these principles and practices and we're trying to quantify. So um, move to my next slide, if you will. Uh, one more, planning challenges. That's what I wanted to talk about. Move down to the next slide. Uh, this was a picture I'll, and I'll, I'll finish up briefly. Dr. Walker is on the top left and, and he, I'm telling you, he, this is a, uh, to say you can take what you have, you can modify, you can adjust and you can tweak and you can make these systems work, or you can go out and buy new equipment or used equipment that's already set up. That's the top right. Um, you can be successful in any kind of way you want to at planning, but you will have planning challenges until you figure out cause and effect and you get that right. Diverse systems, if that's what keeps these guys interested, uh, I guess they're all gamblers and like to tweak things. I don't know, but, but, um, uh, it's too dynamic to quantify. I'll leave you with uh, this thought, participants. If if if, uh, if if you think I want to know what yardsticks, what 
what measures of success people are using. I like to hear from folks and uh, uh, cause I think that's different from farm to farm to farm. And that measure of success, once you define that and you go back and tweak your system, you then you'll, you'll be hitting a home run. Uh, all right, Burton, whatever you say, we got to let Archie talk. <laughs> yeah, just one one key uh, in the in the whole big scheme of things, the stick we need to be measuring with is long term sustainability and profitability, and that we can stay in business generationally doing what we're doing. And if and if it looks like we're going the wrong direction, we need to make changes. And it looks to me like moving forward, it looks more biological and less chemical. Uh, lower input, um, not necessarily higher yields, but lower input seems a sustainable way for me anyway. Thanks. Thanks for those comments. All right, Mr. Archie, you, uh, you, you take it away. Okay, so, so far we've heard much good technical information about how to implement soil health management systems, but now we want to focus our attention on another question. That is, is there a business case for farmers adopting soil health management systems? In other words, do soil health management systems increase farm profitability? We do this by looking at cost and benefit analysis and incremental production changes when soil health management systems are adopted affect four components of farm profitability. Number one, reduced expenses as a benefit. Number two, potentially additional revenue as a benefit. Number three, additional expense as a cost. And then also potentially reduced revenue as a cost. For example, if your yields do decline as you adopt the soil health management system, this will do, be reduced revenue and this is a cost. If you take the summation of points one and two, minus the summation of three and four, this is the net impact of the production change or the cost and benefits of adopting a soil health management system. The method of analysis that we use is partial budget analysis. And in partial budget analysis, the results are changes in net farm income not absolute levels. Keep in mind that the numbers that we look at today from economic results represent changes as you adopt the soil health management system and convert from conventional tillers. This isn't the absolute per acre profit level of a farm, but it's a change. We have uh, more information about the methods that we use in partial budget analysis at our website at this uh, web address listed here. So some months ago, uh, John Shanahan, our, my colleague at the Soil Health Institute, and David I uh, visited with Burton. We collect some information to do partial um, budget analysis for his farm. Um, uh, we collected the information for all his crops. Burton mentioned all the crops that he grows, but today we're just going to focus in on cotton. So in, in our uh, slide here, we have on the left, reduce fit field activities and inputs. This is if you're in conventional production and you convert over to some type of soil health management system, the question is what type of reduced expenses are you going to have? Well, if you are in conventional tillage and tillage and tilling the soil and you cease the tilling, the first thing that's going to happen is you're going to decrease all the expenses associated with tillage. So when we visited with Burton, he told us that in a conventional system, he would be discarrowing two times, he would use a better hip for one time, and then he would plant. Now, and then later on after it was planted, the benefits of the soil health management system, including cover crops, were that he would be able to reduce his herbicide applications of, of dicamba, two sprays with dicamba, and then two different sprays of insecticides, bidrin and bifidrin, and then another spray application of stratego, a fungicide, all as the benefit of applying the reduced tillage in cover crops. Also, uh, 
he has been able to eliminate one ton of lime applied each year. He mentioned uh, water infiltration as a benefit and in his irrigated land, he has been able to reduce his irrigation applications by two turns of the pivot. Um, due to the increased crop resiliency, Burton has reached a point uh, that he doesn't purchase crop insurance on his cotton ground. And the average premium in Georgia for irrigated cotton is $8 per acre for insurance. So we have a, taken that as a benefit. And also as re, uh, erosion has reduced, Burton spends less time during the off season repairing his fields where his fields have washed. We heard him mention that he doesn't have any washes on his land. So during the off year when his cover crops are off season, when his cover crops are growing, he is able to save 30 annual hours of going out and repairing his fields, pushing back up or hiring somebody custom hire to push it back up with a bulldozer or, or clean out ditches with a backhoe. And based on the, the method, methods that we use, we estimate this over his whole acreage to have a value of $3 per acre. So these are all the benefits of adopting a soil health management system with cover crops. But of course, there are always going to be costs associated with it also, and this is the cover crop system. So on the right hand side, we have the additional field activities and inputs associated with Burton's soil health management system. And the cotton, he plants the cover crop mix with a no-till drill. And his cover crops before cotton, uh, the cost of the mix is $40 per acre, and the mix consists of black oats, annual rye, and clover, and vetch. So after the cover crop is planted, Burton has the intention of harvesting this cover crop for silage. So he does apply 50 units of nitrogen with liquid nitrogen, 32%. So the cover crops are, are growing. And then later on, before he comes in and plants the cotton, he harvests the cover crops for silage. And the net value of this harvested silage, after you take out the harvesting expenses, is equal to $400 per acre. So then after the uh, cover crops are harvested, Burton comes in with a strip till rig and his planter is pulled behind the tractor that comes in and plants the cotton. So we now see that what we have are the two comparative uh, lists of field activities for conventional tillage and the soil health management system. In this case, it's strip till with cover crops. And we heard Burton mention that he is thinking about transitioning into full no-till with his cotton, but when we visited with him, uh, he reported to us the, his strip till uh, situation. So now with our, our methods, we do the economic analysis of this for cotton. So now we, we get a comparison uh, on the, our two columns of um, expenses here. The first column are reduced expenses. They correspond to that left column where he had all the field activities and the right column corresponds to the additional field activities. So we see looking at the additional expense for seed, this is $40 that we looked at in the previous slide, $40 for the seed. And then we um, go on down our list. The first is a fertilizer and amendments. This 5250 was the cost that we determined for applying lime each year, one ton of lime. This is the uh, applied lime, 5250 per year. Burton is saving because of this strip till with cover crops. And then the pesticides that we, we listed in the previous slide, the, the value of the pesticides was $25.03. And then, uh, now let's go on down and look at the equipment ownership because these other categories of fuel, electricity, and labor, they're mostly applied to this. The tillage activities that Burton has uh, eliminated have a value of equipment. This is on a per acre basis in our methodology of uh, estimating the equipment cost is $34.38 that Burton is saving in the, the value of um, equipment necessary to do those tillage activities. 
and the, the, the fuel and electricity and labor are associated um, with that equipment, act, uh, the equipment reductions. And also in, in the fuel and electricity, that would also include the, uh, the value to turn the pivots uh, two times. That's a reduced cost. So then we have um, back on the additional side, the, the cost of the nitrogen that uh, uh, Burton is putting on the um, a cover crop to harvest it for silage is $23.44. So going on down to the total expenses, this uh, soil health management system of cover crops has reduced Burton's cost by $151.89 per acre. And the additional costs are $96.36. So just before we look at any revenue components of this, we see that Burton's net farm income from the soil health management system has increased about $55 per acre. But then going on down um, lower, we see some uh, additional uh, benefits. Um, Burton's cotton yield has increased by 200 pounds per acre. And this increase specifically is due to the benefits of the uh, soil health management system. This is a uh, an average per year. We heard uh, Burton show a slide and mention some examples of when his uh, cotton yield was greater uh, in, in some years because it had more crop resilience. So putting a, a value uh, to that, we're using 67 cents per pound as a long-term average. We don't want our results to be influenced by any temporary um, conditions of high prices or low prices. So we're using 67 cents um, per pound. So there's additional revenue uh, from that, but also um, the cover crops were harvested for silage. And the, the value that we determine from that uh, silage is $400 per acre. So the increased lint value uh, for the increased um, yield is uh, $134 per acre, and then you add the $400 for the silage. So the total benefit for revenue is $534. So we sum up all the benefits. That's the reduced expenses, the additional revenue. So the, the total change in benefits is $685.89 and still the cost of this are only $96.36. So um, the cotton acreage per acre, the uh, net change in net farm income is $589.53. So this is uh, the, the methodology that we apply. This is what we determine for, for Burton's farm with cotton. So this gives some idea how to make an estimation of what your farm would look like if the considerations that you should make if you're considering the adopt the soil health management system. And what I'm going to do is to, to go back up and if Burton would like to, to um, comment on these field activities and comment on how this cotton compares to some of his other crops and then potentially what he may be thinking about changing in this. Uh, Burton, would you like to comment on this? I'm sure maybe one of the things that jumps out to, to the other folks is, well, maybe I don't make silage, I don't have cattle, and so take that $400 off, it changes that balance sheet quite a bit. But um, looking at it from the from the least common denominator side, if, if you can just save $50 an acre in inputs, um, even if your yield doesn't change, uh, it's significant. But if you can, uh, especially with using cover ahead of cotton, uh, get more water in the ground. It's it's pretty pretty quickly apparent. Um, I know Gaines talked about it, um, but just getting those those summertime rains in the ground uh, can really add some add some yield uh, to cotton, especially that long growing season. We have opportunities to to add some yield if we can can be more efficient with our water uh, utilization. So. Um, I did plant, like I say, I think I said it before, we did plant some uh, no-till cotton. Uh, I expect to plant more of that, you know, uh, 
conversion from from strip till to a true continuous no till is is not a crop by crop rollout it's a field by field you just stop tilling that field so as rotation brings uh, uh, brings cotton around to some of my no till fields um yeah we will plant more no till cotton and i i, I may I, I feel like based on what i've seen the last two years that uh, I will probably just stop strip tilling period for cotton and just, just no till it, whether it's in a field that's been converted to continuous no till or not. I just, it looks like, it looks like it has, has worked well overall, but I want to make sure that, um, I don't run into any big challenges that I don't see coming and end up losing a lot of revenue. So it will be pretty careful about that. Um, multi-species blends are great but you can start with something simple. And so uh, live roots all the time, that overwinter time frame, just, just keeping the soil held together and, and getting those winter rains in the ground uh, is a great start to, to anyone that wants to, to play with cover a little bit. You don't necessarily have to start with a, an eight or 10 way blend. You don't necessarily have to start with eight foot tall cereal rye. There's, there's something else uh, you can try that's a, feels a little less risky to a beginner probably. Mm -hmm. Okay, Burton, let's look over at these uh, pesticide reductions for the herbicides and insecticides and the uh, fungicide. How, long, how many years did it take before you were able to realize those reductions? Was it something that happened immediately? Is this something that, that developed over time as your soil health was improving? That's a good question. Um, we actually have only been growing cotton again here. We had taken cotton out of the rotation. Um, uh, we, we were in the dairy business as well through the mid eighties to the mid nineties. And uh, somewhere along the way, we had stopped growing cotton for a while. Um, I believe this was, I can't remember, this is my third or my fourth year uh, putting cotton back in the rotation now. Um, but, with all the multi-species blends and all the beneficial insects and, and the diversity, uh, the first time we put cotton back in um, was, uh, we just, we did not use near the herbicide that, that is typically used in the, in the county by most of the conventional growers um, or the insecticide or the fungicide. Uh, we did spray fungicide one time, um, because we had a bad case of, uh, we didn't have it personally, but we saw it coming. I believe it's uh, was a target spot. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, a lot of people were, were having pretty significant uh, issues and we did it as a, as a precaution. Uh, I kind of wish that I'd left some untreated just to see what happened. But again, the, the more, the more healthy the soil, the more resilient the crop, and uh, we've just used very little by by uh, any of the applied uh, insecticides, fungicides, and even herbicides. Mm -hmm. Now, the um, one ton one ton of lime reduced. I'm I'm assuming that you were soil testing and you saw that you didn't need the lime, so you quit applying it. How many years after the cover crops were being used before you realized that benefit? I really don't think that we have used, we've not really used dolomite lime as a as a normal application for probably 20 years. Um, so we've not always been using multi-species cover crop blends. We have been using at least single species for, for quite a long time. Um, but we've been farming with a biological mindset uh, for a long time. And we, we, we just, you want we haven't mention, spread lime for a long time. Peyton? You want to mention your, the litter applications or routine, I would say, uh, would contribute to th that anyway. Okay. Yeah. We, we, uh, we used to use two tons of litter ahead of a uh, head of corn and a head of cotton. Um, uh, we've backed that down our uh, several years ago now. I'm not sure how many, maybe as many as six or seven, uh, where we're just putting out a ton and a half of chicken litter. 
and we're blending a thousand pounds of gypsum with it and plant uh, spread it in one pass uh, to get a lot of soluble calcium and some sulfur and uh, it's just done a really nice job for us but we our pHs are, are very static we just see very little change okay so this um, litter that you're applying I think we determined that if you were doing conventional till you would still be doing that anyway that's really not part of the soil health management system that's uh, just something you'd be doing anyway except that's, that it contributes yeah. to the calcium right, right. yeah yeah but okay. a lot of farmers use chicken litter uh even conventional guys right. some of them do right and they're still having to apply the lime though so we can contribute that to your cover crops and that, that reduction for you Peyton could maybe speak better to, to how much lime most people apply, but I think one ton of lime is probably off on the low side. Let's just, it, it could be. Let's just remember the AC map that I showed you and the tremendous mm -hmm. variability and leave it at that. <laughs> okay. True. Okay, um, Burton, one more thing. Let's look at the crop insurance. You're not buying crop insurance for your cotton. Um, tell us, what does your banker think about that? You're not buying crop insurance. Um, well, <laughs> any comments about that? Um, I don't know what to say about that. I, it, 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 it's. I, I'm not saying that I have a, a a bank account sitting somewhere with a few million dollars spare change, in case yeah. we run into a problem. Um, but I, I will say that. Uh, my dad's mindset uh, going way back uh, into the 80s was uh, that irrigation was the was his best way to guarantee revenue from a crop. And so he has worked uh, over the years and I pretty much uh, signed on for that same uh, train of, of thought that that uh, center pivot uh, system premium uh or or a payment was was about as good of a cover uh, of a insurance premium as there could be but uh truly the the resilience in the system um diversity uh we've got a long history with uh, with our lender and he has he or she has not asked us to use crop insurance um, for at least the last 20 years. I know there was a point somewhere along the way. I remember maybe 25 years ago that um, we had to get some crop insurance for a, for a cotton crop, but that was a long time ago. And uh, I think due to, to long-term sustainability and, and lower input systems, um, our lender's been very comfortable with, with not uh, requiring us to get crop insurance. Right. Yes, I, re I remember when we visited with you, you mentioned that, that your lender considered you low risk with That's your correct. soil health management system. I looked at it as a good thing. And um, th that's uh, going forward with expanding these practices, that, that's something that would be important if lenders recognize the the benefits of soil health management systems to, to reduce risk. So we'll take one more look at the table. Um, we, if any of the other uh, producers would like to comment on the inputs we looked at or any economic benefits, I know this was the only economic results that we have for Burton's farm. If anybody else, any of the other producers would like to comment about maybe something they've observed from the economics of their um, production practices on their farm. Archie, I know that Rocky and Gaines both had to go. I know Anthony is, is still on. Um, but I'll just say again, we, we, we run the gamut um, of, uh, well, I'm trying to think of the best way to say this, but I, uh, my growers know me, so I guess the rest of the participants ought to know this. I think it's dangerous if, if we're not careful with the last little bit that we covered, we paint the wrong picture. So, so one one person's uh, financial security may or may not be attributed to soil health principles and practices. In this case, I don't disagree with anything you said or Burton said. That that's something that they committed to a long time ago, and uh, and maybe that's right. 
um, want to be sure that that the, the long term sustainability when it comes to the growers bottom dollar can depend also on a whole different set of circumstances as well. So anyway, just just for the record, since this was a Georgia session that we need to be uh, all inclusive, we got we, we have tremendous variation out there. Burton is a good example, certainly, but. Um, well, Peyton, that was that was a good concluding comment. That was the last uh, presentation that, that I had, and uh, yeah. so I'll turn it back over to you. I don't know that we can do anything other than answer questions, David. Do you you you're you're you got? Yeah, it. folks, got any class questions? Uh, if not, we can uh, conclude this. One thing I will say, I, I appreciate what Archie shares, and, and I'm sensitive to what Peyton said too, because but. Generally, what folks do is they just think about the cost. Cover crops going to cost me cover, seeding, trip across field, and they don't think about the other side of the coin that there are some savings that can be had, relatively quick, related to things such as weed control and, and such. Uh, you know, so yeah, I don't know if uh, Burton really has uh, an extra 500 bucks in his pocket every <laughs> every acre or not. But the point is that there are some savings and it's not all out of pocket and stuff. And, and I think that's really the value of what Archie's trying to He kind of looked at that, just comparing apples to apples, it was 50 bucks. Then, then he added in the, the benefit of increased uh, yield is a little more. And then the grazing thing or the removal of the silage was, you know, that's just like icing on the cake if you can do that. So. But with that, Peyton, we're up a, a little over two hours. I think we'll probably just wind this up. I want to compliment you all there in Georgia, what you got going on. Uh, a lot of different stuff, a lot of interesting stuff. I think you're on the road to, to success, especially when you get that partnership between the producers and the extension. And I can't say that enough. That's a really good partnership, Peyton. I want to applaud you for that. And with that, I guess we'll just call it a day and appreciate your effort and encourage folks to join in next week when we'll be talking to a few farmers from up in northeastern uh, North Carolina. With that, adios.